All right. Well, let's gather together. It's good to be together. For those of you um, who were not able to be with us on Saturday, we will have the video available for you in a little bit. We do have notes tonight. We also did get in another uh, box of the books. So if anybody did not get the um, the supplemental book um, by Warren Wearsby that goes along with what we're doing. Just just so you know, I've been asked a couple times, we're not tracking, we're doing our own thing and Warren's doing his. That's just additional uh, material for you. And uh, if you're new, if you've just joined us in the last week or two, um, we do make all of our sessions available on our church YouTube channel. So just go to the YouTube. Uh, it's just under HT Church and you will be able to find it and catch up. And the notes, the class notes, are always available in the YouTube show notes as a PDF for you. So we said last time that we are now moving into a different part of the book. We're heading into chapter 5 tonight, but in chapter 1, we saw Jesus revealing himself to John in his glory. We have also examined now Jesus' letters to the seven churches of Asia in chapters 2 and 3. And we said that those, those were also letters to us. The Lord's words there are important for all of us who live in the last days. And I think the last time we took a show of hands, almost everybody thought that we were in the last days. And the one person that didn't raise their hand were so scared about the last days that they weren't sure if they should raise their hand or not. But anyway... And now we've come into the visionary portion of the book. So chapter 4 began a series of visions which are going to continue to the end of the book. So Revelation now becomes a series of prophetic experiences in which God is going to show to John his program of the end times. And that's going to culminate in the return of Christ to set up his kingdom in this world. Uh, recall with me again that a lot of what John sees, much of what he sees is in general chronological order, but there are a few cutaway scenes. And this can cause confusion when people read Revelation because they don't realize that sometimes the camera has pulled away to another scene. Uh, in any case, almost everything that John talks about is going to center around that pivotal period of time that is coming, a seven-year time period. And when those seven years have been completed, Jesus will return in power and glory. So chapters four and five really set the tone for the rest of the book. They are really designed in part to reinforce to us who's in control. God is in control of things. And so last week in chapter 4, we saw the Father seated in glory and receiving worship. And in chapter 5, where we're going tonight, Christ the Son will receive glory. So we've been summarizing this uh, by saying that in chapter 4, the Father is, is exalted as creator. And in chapter 5, the Son is exalted as redeemer. So let's read um, those verses of Revelation 5. It's not a long chapter. It's 14 verses. <clears throat> John says, And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue 
and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. In my opinion, this is one of the most awesome chapters in the entire Bible. And we're going to see here again, if you can't figure it out already, that Revelation is always like an echo of the prophecies of the Old Testament. This amazing scene amplifies the vision that we've talked about uh, over the months that was seen by the prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 7. So I've given you that as well. Let's, let's look at Daniel 7 together. Daniel is seeing his vision here of the Son of Man. He says, I watched till thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. And then in verse 13, he says, I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. So. I think you can see that Daniel 7 seems to be perhaps a little snapshot of the larger scene in Revelation 5. And in Revelation 5, because we are blessed to live in a time when we have the revelation of Jesus and we know about Jesus' victory, we have many important details, of course, that Daniel did not have. But Revelation 5 shows us the Son of Man receiving dominion from the Father and receiving the acclamation of heaven. So let's look through this. Let's walk through this verse by verse as we always like to do at the speed of a snail. Amen. That should be, that should be on our uh, seal, on our coat. If we have a coat of arms for Harvest Time University, it should be like a, a snail harvesting or something. I don't know. Verse 1, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. So what is this special scroll in the right hand of God? Now, we mentioned earlier that when John was writing, books were just coming into their own. It was the new tech of the day, if you will. Scrolls were still the dominant form of written material, but books had many advantages over scrolls and became more popular. Most of the scholars would likely say here, though, that Jesus is about to be handed a scroll. And this is a scroll with seven seals. Now, in the Roman Empire, some um, wills or other important documents were sealed like that with seven seals. And I don't think that these seals have anything to do with that custom. It could um, signify the importance of the document. But I think it's also just one more example of how the number seven is woven throughout the book of Revelation. Every time there's a seven, God is highlighting that to you, letting you know that this is a, a picture of something that is spiritually perfect. It's a spiritually complete and perfect work that God is doing. And this scroll was written on the inside and the outside. Now, that's kind of odd. The scroll contains important information. And as we read through the whole chapter and the chapters to come, we're going to conclude that it probably has to do with all of the details 
of God's plan to exalt Jesus, to send Jesus and wrap up the plan of salvation on the earth. Wouldn't you love, how many of you would love to be able to read what's on the inside of that scroll? Okay, that's a trick question. You don't need to because you have the book of Revelation. Gotcha. Sometimes scrolls were also written upon the outside as well. And that was a way of putting a summary on the outside of the scroll so that you would know what was in it, right? If you had a few scrolls in your house, you wanted to know which one was, you know, uh, your will and which one was the, was the recipe for lamb, right? So you went right on the outside. It was almost perhaps like a table of contents. Uh, in fact, uh, in the Bible, Ezekiel was actually given a scroll like this. And you can read about that in Ezekiel chapter 2, written on the inside and the outside. So in verse 2, John says, Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. So there are a couple of different theories about this passage, and they're all very interesting. First, uh, we have no idea who this angel is, only that he's powerful. And I would say he's probably really powerful because he is able to somehow convey uh, and issue this challenge to all of creation. And yet the angel is not the focus here. The focus is on what he says. And clearly there is a request and a, and a challenge to all of creation, to find a person who's worthy to open the scroll. There has to be a suitable person found who has the right and who has the ability to execute the plan of God. In fact, what this scroll is, what it contains, what it represents, is so holy that the challenge failed. Not only could no one be found who could open it and carry it out, but it was so holy and awesome that they couldn't even find anybody who was worthy to look at it. I mean, you know a book is holy when you're not holy enough to read the contents, the table of contents, right? One theory says that heaven was looking for someone who was completely pure and worthy in their moral character. Now, we know that obviously the answer to that quest is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. He would be, if that were the qualification, he would be the only one worthy to take the scroll and open it. But I think there's a lot more to it than that. The reason I can say that pretty confidently is because as we go further down, we discover that Jesus is worthy to open the scroll because he was slain and redeemed us. So although the Lord obviously has a moral excellence that no one can surpass, that is not the entirety of the matter. Some people believe that the scroll is connected to the ownership of the world system and the right to rule the world system. And that makes a lot of sense to me. And if that's the case, then I believe that John is weeping because he knows that in accordance with Jewish culture, as Jewish people practice um, their laws and their customs of ownership, land ownership and things, the scroll must be opened now. If the scroll cannot be opened, and if it cannot be opened now, then what that scroll is about, and it's the world and the rulership of the world, the world would be lost to the devil forever. And that's quite a thought. So no wonder John was weeping greatly. So to understand this idea and what might have been in John's mind as a Jewish man of the first century with the education, the cultural background that he had, to understand what was in John's mind, we need to talk about the Hebrew concept of the kinsman redeemer. So these are two concepts that we kind of understand, but there is an important way in, in the Jewish law and custom in which we kind of tie these customs together, a kinsman redeemer. So when God created man, he gave man dominion over the world. 
Many of you will know that when the Bible talks about the world, we don't necessarily mean the planet Earth in the sense of, you know, the physical planet that we're standing on. What we mean is how the world works, its governments, its cultures, its systems. Remember how John in his letter said, love not the world. You remember that? He says, love not the world. So when John is saying love not the world, he doesn't mean you should hate the planet. It's not what he's talking about. He's telling you not to love, not to fall in love, be infatuated and flow along with what we might call the world system. See, the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In other words, God owns this planet, but someone else is exercising dominion over the systems that govern how things go on this planet, and particularly with respect to you and me, human beings. How did this come about? Well, this is, again, another revelation issue that goes all the way back to Genesis, Satan gained dominion over this world, over the world system. He took it from Adam and Eve when they sinned. Our first parents sinned. When Adam and Eve obeyed the devil, disobeyed God, and obeyed the enemy, they lost their dominion. Their dominion vested in the hands of Satan. Now, you know, Paul tells us in Romans that to whomever you yield yourselves as servants to obey, you are that person's servant. And that is what happened to the entire human race when we ceased to obey God and obeyed the devil instead. We are all born, unfortunately, under that dominion, under the dominion of the enemy because we have all inherited this sin and this We've inherited the disposition to sin from Adam, and then we ourselves also commit sins as we go along in life. So do you remember when Jesus was being tempted in the desert by Satan? We read that at the beginning of the Gospels at Luke chapter 4, gives it to us in some detail. You remember when the devil showed Jesus, he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. This was a supernatural vision, and he said to Jesus, all this authority I will give you and their glory. In other words, the glory of those kingdoms. For this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. That's quite a temptation. I only know one person who probably could have resisted that temptation. But I want you to notice that Jesus did not dispute that assertion of the devil. Jesus did not say to him, no devil, you do not own the kingdoms of the world. Now, Jesus had no qualms about answering Satan back with the word of God when Satan misstepped or twisted things. In fact, Jesus said later on in the Gospels, in John 14, that the devil was the prince of this world. The Bible also calls the devil the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4 that he is the God of this age. That doesn't mean that Satan is a God like Almighty God. But listen, here's the point. For those who disobey the God of the Bible, Satan certainly does rule this present evil age like a God. Paul tells us, uh, in Ephesians 2, that he's the prince of the power of the air and he is the spirit that is now at work in the lives of what Paul called the children of disobedience. So, so are, are you tracking with me here? Does this, does this make sense? Okay, good. But now I want you to also remember that, thank God, after his resurrection, Jesus said that he, Jesus, now has all authority in heaven and earth. Thank God, three people were excited about that. That's is good news after all that, that last couple of bad news paragraphs that I read. However, those of us who are living in this current age, we don't yet see Jesus exercising all of his authority. You and I, Paul says, we have been 
taken out, we have been literally, it's the same word that is used, uh, that people use uh, and translate as raptured. It's like we've been raptured out of the kingdom of darkness and we've been transferred over into the kingdom of God's beloved son. So you and I are under the authority and the dominion of the kingdom of Christ. But yet Jesus has not yet taken his power to himself and begun to reign over the whole earth to extend that authority. Jesus has all authority and Jesus is reigning, but he has not. How many of you are from countries? This is a weird question, but how many of you are from countries where they have a king or a queen? Anybody? Nobody? We have no loyal British subjects in the house tonight? Okay. So Jesus is reigning as a king, but he has not yet completely made the earth his realm on a practical level. Because if he had, I guarantee you things would look mighty different. But I'd like you to think about this. That is actually what the book of Revelation is about, at least a part of what it's about. It's about God taking the power which he has, the right to exercise, and then finally, at a certain point in history, he will choose to exercise his power and put an end to the reign, to the dominion of the enemy over human life. And when we go a little deeper into the book, you're going to see uh, loud voices in Revelation 11, loud voices declaring in heaven that the kingdoms of this world have now become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And you've heard me mention, of course, before how we find those words in Handel's famous Hallelujah Chorus. But perhaps you didn't know that that song is about the moment when God chooses to finally exercise his authority and take back the world and its systems from the devil. So the Hallelujah Chorus is not Christmas music, it's second coming music. And if Jesus has all authority and then therefore can take back the world system from the devil? Why hasn't he done so yet? Well, one reason is that God is merciful. The Bible tells us that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, but he is patient. He is not willing that any should perish. If Jesus had come five years ago or 10 or 20, I won't ask for a show of hands, but perhaps many of us would be either in hell tonight or on the way in the express lane, right? That little lane with the diamond in it, express. Aren't you glad for God's mercies? Another reason why the Lord might not have returned yet is that perhaps, and this seems to also be true at the same time. You know that two theories of some of these things can be true at the same time and both make sense. They both reflect the nature of God. Listen, perhaps there is a specific time that God has appointed for the final redemption of the world. And this idea is sometimes referred to as Adam's lease. Perhaps there was a grant of time, perhaps there was a fixed amount of time that God gave to Adam as a time of stewardship, and then following that time of stewardship, Adam would give account to God. So you say, where do you find ideas like that? Well, there are set times in Scripture. So in Acts chapter 1, we read this, Jesus is about to ascend, and says, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Because they're thinking, okay, we've got everything. We've got, we've got the whole Daniel 7, son of man thing. You're risen and so forth. Now you can come with the clouds of heaven. And Jesus says, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses for me or to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the, of the earth. What do I learn from that? Well, number one, I learned that there are some things that are none of my business. 
Jesus wants us to know that we've got a job to do and that job needs to be our focus. And so therefore, unnecessary speculations are not godly. It's fun. It's cool. It's interesting to speculate on things like that. But if you get bogged down there, you know what happens? You become about that and you stop doing what you're supposed to be doing. And you end up spending, you know, nine hours a day on YouTube watching videos about the Nephilim. And that's not what God wants. He who has ears to hear. (laughs) However, Jesus is also indicating to us there that God does indeed seem to have some set times or seasons in his plan. You know, God doesn't wake up like, what are we doing today? He has set times in his plan. And Jesus is telling us that the Father has reserved those seasons to himself. In Psalm 102, we read that God has a set time to arise and have mercy on Zion, on his city. And those issues are all connected. And perhaps that's even what the apostles were thinking when they asked Jesus about that. They might have actually been thinking about Psalm 102. The set time has come to favor Zion. So all of that to say, This could explain why John was weeping, and weeping probably so profusely. Being Jewish, John knew about the laws and customs regarding the redemption of property. So in the Old Testament, if property was mortgaged, there was a time that was limited where you could redeem it back, just like we have. God never wanted people's property in Israel to be permanently lost from their family inheritance. So if your property was lost to you, you could redeem it at the time appointed for its redemption. They say, well, that's a weird custom. No, it's not. This exists in all 50 states, doesn't it? This is very similar how in our culture, you might be able to get your property back from the bank as long as the foreclosure has not been completed on your property. So In the Jewish culture, if you were not able to redeem your property because of the lack of money or perhaps you died, a relative might be able to come along and redeem that property for you. And then that way, that property would not permanently be lost to your family. Are are you tracking with me on that? Okay, so, but what happens if this set time for redemption has passed and neither you nor your kinsman redeemer had been able to redeem the property, then the property's lost forever. So here in Revelation 5, I want to say to you that I believe the scripture's showing us Jesus as our kinsman redeemer. Now, Jesus just couldn't come down as God the Son in his power and simply take back the world from the devil. Why not? Well, the reason is simple. God had given the world to mankind. Do you remember what Satan said to Jesus and Jesus did not contradict him? That has been delivered to me. Isn't that interesting? And so in order to redeem the world for mankind's sake, only another man could be the redeemer. Man had lost it and given it away. Some man must therefore be the one to undo that. But where could we find a worthy man, someone who could be a redeemer for us, someone who was not in the stream of Adam's sin, someone who was unaffected by that sin? And where could we find a man who was so pure that he could also die as a sacrifice for the sins of others? I think you know the answer to that. Nor could God simply just make another man out of the ground and start over with a new group of people that way, the way that he had made Adam and made Eve from him. For one thing, Adam's sin, if you recall, had caused God to curse the ground for his sake. So I believe that John is weeping because the time has come now for the world to be redeemed and yet no one anywhere in creation is worthy to take the scroll and open its seven seals and put the plan of God in motion to take the world back for the government of God. 
But there is one person, there's one man, praise the Lord, who prevailed. And so he became our kinsman redeemer. He's not only God, but he became a man, a man without sin. And he meets every qualification to redeem the human race and the world. And his name is Jesus. So in verse five, John says, but one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Or some people translate it. Stop weeping. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Jesus has prevailed. Notice that Jesus still identifies with David and with the tribe of Judah. He is the root that the Bible prophesied was going to spring up from the line of David. You can read about that in Isaiah 11. It says, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, that's David's father, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. In other words, that royal family would be cut down like a tree, but nevertheless, God says, you cut it down, but a shoot is going to grow up out of it nonetheless. Jesus identifies with David, and Revelation describes Jesus in connection with David three times. That is not by accident, and you probably know, some of you, that um, the life and career of David really is a type, it's a foreshadowing of the life in Jesus in many ways. In, in speaking of God's choosing David, God says this, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who shall fulfill all my will. I love it. Now, we are, I think, very familiar as believers with the first part of that phrase, right? A man after my own heart. We've all heard that. But not the second part. David was also a man who would fulfill all of God's will. Jesus is the ultimate example of the man who is after God's heart and the ultimate example of the man who fulfills all of God's will. So Jesus is not ashamed to call himself after David because David is a, the prototype of the one who was to come. David's life was a prophecy of Jesus' life in his obedience, his zeal for God, and in his rejected, reject, uh, rejection sorry, and later acceptance. This will blow your mind. Jesus came to the kingship like David first being received as king only by some of the people, not by all of the people. And then later, after a seven-year period, Jesus will come into the fullness of kingship, just as David had a seven-year war before he was received as king over all Israel. There's a lot to say about how Jesus resembles David, but we, we can't cover all of that tonight. But that's that's just a taste, and that has a lot of bearing on Jesus' um, perhaps perspective on his own self and mission. Verse 6, John says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures. So if you haven't been with us, these are the cherubs that actually um, <clears throat> are at the center there of the worship of God, and they bear up his throne. <clears throat> and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So there's actually another reference to Isaiah 11 in this verse, that being the seven spirits of God. So Isaiah 11 begins with that word about the rod of Jesse. In that same verse, it rolls into the prophecy about the seven spirits of God. And we've mentioned this a couple of times, how that the Holy Spirit has this sevenfold ministry in our lives, his personal presence and the way that he works in our lives. So remember with me, if you haven't been with us, uh, there, there are not seven Holy Spirits, but he works in seven ways. So here at the throne of God, with the angelic hierarchy, with the human hierarchy, we see the lamb standing. He is a powerful lion, yes, but he's also a humble lamb who was meant to be slain for us. And he combines those things in himself. So let's talk about this description of Christ. Notice that the lamb, <coughs> excuse me, these allergies are still after me. So 
All right. Sorry about that. Notice that the lamb has seven horns and seven eyes. So we talked about the fact that in Revelation, seven stands for perfection and spiritual completion. So the fact that he has seven eyes means that he sums up the perfection of wisdom. So we talked before about how these living creatures, you remember how they are full of eyes and it has to do with the fact that they're filled with the spirit of wisdom that, that nothing escapes God's gaze and so on. What about the horns? Well, horns are a little different. In the Hebrew mind, and you see this all throughout the Old Testament, horns were, were a symbol of power and a symbol of kingship. And you will see horns used that way, not only in Revelation, but in other places. So when we read the Psalms and the prophets, you're going to see horns being spoken of in that way also. That sounds strange to us because we don't have that picture in our culture. But David said, for example, in Psalm 92, he said that God has lifted up my horn like a wild ox. So what he meant by that was that God had given him power and caused him to triumph. So when we see that the lamb has seven horns, that means that Jesus has received all power from God. Because again, there's that seven. God is marking it with that seven. That's like shorthand for just the, the fullness of power. So as the anointed one of God, as the Messiah, as the son of man, Jesus possesses all the fullness of power and all the fullness of wisdom. So that is the meaning of the, of the seven horns and seven eyes that this very special lamb possesses. But there's another meaning here in the text that John's trying to convey to you, or that I should say that heaven is trying to convey to John. And it's highly important. I want you to notice that it is as a lamb that Christ has conquered, not as a lion. Now he's called the lion for sure, but notice who is reigning? How do they show him as reigning in power? It's as a lamb that he has conquered. Consider this. Jesus reigns as the lion because he conquered as the lamb. It's not through his sheer power that God defeated Satan, but it was through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as the lamb of God. So I hope you can catch that symbolism here. It's, it's not enough to say that Jesus has all power and all wisdom. I think what John wants us to see, equally so, is that it is in the death of Christ. It's in the cross and the sacrificing of the Lamb. That's where you see the power of God and the wisdom of God being displayed. You remember with me, the Bible says that it is through the foolishness of these things, the way that people consider foolishness, that God saved the world. The Bible teaches us that the weakness of God displayed through the cross is stronger than the strength of men. And the foolishness of God displayed in the foolishness of the cross and the foolishness of proclaiming the message of the cross, that is stronger than the wisdom of men. So the plan of God that Christ should sacrifice himself. By the way, this is deep. It was okay if you had protein before coming in here to class tonight. It was probably a good idea. The plan of God that Christ was going to sacrifice himself out of love for the sins of the human race. That was the wisest and most powerful plan that God could have devised. Even though to the devil and to human beings who have not been born again, it seems like the most ridiculous plan ever. And the cross was the plan that has caused the greatest glory to be given to God and has caused the greatest praise to be given to God's grace. Paul talks about this plan and he says it is not the wisdom of the world, nor is it the wisdom of the demonic princes, but it is a wisdom that none of the princes of this world knew or else Paul says, Paul says they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. So truly he is a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes, but he's a slain lamb with seven horns and seven eyes, the son of God. This plan of God for Jesus to die on a cross is a plan that's full of power and wisdom. Jesus came to die and save the wretched, that's us, by the way, through the wisdom of God and the shedding of his blood. 
Hallelujah. It's no accident that the commission that now is given to Jesus to rule the world here in Revelation 5, it's no accident that the commission to Jesus has as its focal point the death of Christ with him portrayed as a slain lamb. Verse 7 says, Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So Jesus comes before the Father as had been prophesied in Daniel 7, and he receives this commission now to fully execute the word of God, the will of God. Verse 8, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So now the human and angelic leadership in heaven give worship to the Son of God, and each one is lifting up worship to God continually with their heart. Revelation shows us this picture, how the the prayers of the saints are always constantly arising before God, and for lack of a better word, they are are gathered, uh, we could say, collected in these golden bowls, and the Bible portrays them, portrays your prayers as incense that is being stored in heaven and released before God as as a fragrant a scent and aroma in his uh, nostrils. And perhaps we'll have more to say about that, but it will have to be on another night. Verse 9 says, They sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Notice, why is he worthy? Because he was slain. You redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. They say that he is worthy because he was slain and redeemed us. They also say that Jesus has made us kings and priests, and as kings we rule with him. As priests, we intercede for others. We represent others before God. They also confess that they're going to reign with Christ upon the earth. And as we're going to read later on, of course, in Revelation, we will reign with him as kings of his kingdom for a thousand years. However, the priestly ministry, I don't know if you caught this, but the priestly ministry that they refer to there is not said to be something future. You can enter into that ministry now even tonight, and I hope you are. Remember that scripture shows us the priesthood of all believers. Do you know that in the New Testament, you are all saints and you are all priests? A priest is not uh, in the New Testament, maybe in the Old Testament, yes, but a priest is not in the New Testament a member of the clergy who is invested with special powers to pray or perform sacrifices. The New Testament knows nothing of that idea. All of us who are in Christ can go to God praying for others because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 11, John says, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. That's 100 million and thousands of thousands, that's a few extra millions that he sprinkled in, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So up to this point, John, I think you, if you think back through chapter 4 and so far in chapter 5, John has only been giving us a real close-in shot, a close-up of the throne of God. But now the camera is going to pan out, right? And we see the wider scene. Billions of angels have been watching. I think we saw them a little bit in chapter 4, but now John wants you to take out a look across that entire crystal pavement, although uh, John has had a front row seat, perhaps. And they begin to proclaim that the Lamb is worthy. Can you imagine what a shout like that would would sound like? Because, you know, angels are not teensy or timid. Here's another seven for you, by the way. I don't know if you, if you 
caught it or not. Jesus possesses those seven things, power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. Jesus possesses those seven things and he is worthy that the father should confer those things upon him. Listen, as, as God, Jesus already possesses those things, but now all of heaven is confessing that Jesus possesses them also as the perfect man and redeemer as the lamb. Do you see that? Isn't that powerful? I mean, you would agree that in his divine nature, Jesus, of course, possesses all of those things and he should be acclaimed that way as such. But as man also, as perfect man, he is those things as well. And so they acknowledge that Jesus Christ is worthy to rule the earth and the universe for God the Father. Verse 13, in every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. So all creation honors God and Christ with four attributes. You remember we talked about how four is the number of creation. So question Uh, Before anybody asks, I know you're all thinking it. Does that literally mean that everything, including unsaved people, trees, kitty cats, starfish, uh, are all going to praise God like that when this happens? Well, I guess we'll, we'll just have to wait and find out. We'll have to wait and see what that looks like. Verse 14, then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. So the living creatures, these are the, those throne angels, those cherubs, they agree with everything that has been said. And so they say, amen, meaning let it be so. The elders fall down to worship the father. And no doubt, I would think it's not only because of his glory, but probably because they are awestruck by the wisdom of the plan of God to exalt Jesus, the son. We should be too. Paul said at the conclusion of Romans chapter 11, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him, are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen. So that's what I have to share tonight. And uh, you know what? Before I take any questions, I thought we could do something. I thought maybe we could just stand for one or two minutes. and, And I would love to invite you to, just for a couple of minutes, fulfill your function in your ministry as a priest of God. You know, a priest is an intercessor, someone who goes between people and God. So would you function as a priest with me for a couple minutes? Just stand. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to go before the Lord and I want you to intercede on behalf of someone that you know who does not know God or who has walked away from God. And I want you to just ask the Lord through the power of his spirit to bring that person back to himself. So can we just Function as priest. You're you're in training. You're in training for the kingdom of God. So just lift a hand. And this is just between you and the Lord. But Lord, just help us right now by the Holy Spirit. Bring to our mind those for whom we ought to be praying that they might know you, Lord, in a personal way.
thank you, Father, that we can pray with confidence because of the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that your blood has caused us to become priests of God. Thank you, Lord, that we have the authority to pray in the name of Jesus and that we have access, Father, to your throne. So we pray for these people that we care about, Lord. We pray that you would draw them to Jesus by the working of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus, you said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So, Father, draw them to Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you please fulfill the ministry that Jesus said you would have? Would you convict them, we ask, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment? Lord, would you send laborers across their path with the gospel tonight? And, Lord, sometimes it's difficult to share the word. People find it hard to receive if it's coming from a friend, if it's coming from a relative. So, Lord, if we're not the right person that can convey the truth of Christ to them, Lord, send people across their path. Soften their hearts, Lord God. Lord, we pray against any distractions in their lives, Lord, anything that would keep them from hearing, Lord. Give them soft hearts, Lord. Give them a desire, Lord, to know about spiritual things, Lord. Some people are not awakened or interested in spiritual things. Would you cause them to question their life, Lord? Cause them to question what their life is all about. Cause them to question the things that they've received, be it uh, traditions or whatever it is, Lord. Um, Lord, we pray, uh, as Paul um, taught us, Lord, that <clears throat> we pray against strongholds of thinking, Lord, that are, that are blinding people's minds. We pray against the work of the enemy, Lord, that is blinding their eyes so that they can't perceive the truth about Jesus, Lord. Would you, would you tear down strongholds of thinking in every high thing, every false thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, Lord? Lord, just kick out the, the false supports, Lord, the, the pride, the bravado, Lord, whatever it is, the ego, Lord, that is causing them to, to just kind of puff out their chest sometimes and say, I'm okay, I'm, I'm basically a good person. Ah, you know, it's, it's all nonsense. Lord, your word, your word says, is not my word like a fire and like a hammer that shatters the rock. So let the hammer of your word shatter the rock, Lord God, of their thinking. And let your fire begin, Lord, the fire of your word begin to burn in their hearts. Let it be something that is inescapable in their thinking. Uh, something from your word, Lord, just some fragment, Lord, of your word. Let it start to rattle around in their mind and become unescapable, Lord, in their thinking. Lord, to the point where they have to just call out to someone to call you on the phone or, or, or just reach out to somebody and say, what must I do to be saved? So, Lord, give us these souls, Lord God. Lord, as priests of your kingdom, we thank you. Lord, that you've given us authority. And we ask you to have mercy on these people, Lord God. Lord, we've, we've talked tonight. We've mentioned tonight, Father God, that, that you are not slack concerning your promise, Lord. But, but you, you're delaying, Lord. You've delayed to this point because you're not willing that any should perish. But you desire that people should come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. So, Lord, save souls. Let Jesus have the reward of his suffering. Let, let Jesus have the reward of his suffering, Lord, so that people uh, will fill uh, his house, fill this house, fill many houses of worship all around the area. Father, we ask for the wind of the Holy Spirit to come and blow not only through our own church, but just blow across this region, God. Do something that is not just remarkable. Do something that is astonishing, Lord, in our time. God, because you said in the last days you would pour out your spirit on all flesh. Let your people rise up with boldness in prayer and boldness in action, Father, so that many may be reaped a great harvest of souls, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, go ahead and be seated if you like, and uh, we'll, take, we'll take some questions. Miraculously, it's only quarter after eight, so see, it can be done. Well, as preachers always say, I see that hand. Uh, no, I think everybody's just decided to prefer one another in love. Very good. Uh, I, I, I actually only have one question, but there's several parts, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Yes. Um, the last part I'll leave actually goes to the last week, but I'll focus on this week. What language would be written into scrolls. 
and that's one that's one a b now angels are pure and i assume without sin and some of us have even uh, guardian angels i myself believe that so they couldn't open the scroll well the scroll has to do if the scroll has to do with the redemption of man they can't because they're not man man gave away the dominion so it's a it's a man problem that has to be resolved on the man level i mean that's and that's the the importance not just the importance of the incarnation of christ of christ taking on flesh that is the necessity right so we need we need a human being uh in order to do this so i'm sorry what was 1a oh what language well interesting interesting question so well traditionally uh well symbols would be language right because it would it would still have meaning it would need to have meaning so okay well traditionally the idea is that and this is an interesting thing that before god created anything else what did he have to create first he first had to create language because how could create how could god create other things saying let there be whatever if he hadn't made the idea of words yet maybe maybe you never carried it that far back in your thinking but but of course the traditional view is that the language the language of heaven and all of these things that you see right in genesis is uh, is hebrew so so there are there are a lot of there are a lot of reasons for that but uh, traditionally, the belief is that the first thing that God made was the alphabet. Because if you have the alphabet, you can make the combinations. And there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of symbolism and, and all that goes with it and all kinds of biblical numerology and stuff. But I would tend to believe that this is all, that this is all happening uh, in, in Hebrew. So that that's kind of the original language of the human race or whatever and so um, it's interesting when um, if you look into the prophets it talks about the Lord's return and it says he's going to return or restore to people a pure language so that could indicate that in the millennium uh, in the age to come that there will be one language again or we will gradually work towards there just being one language again um, because there won't be the reason why we have languages, different languages now, is because it's too dangerous to let us just have one language. But in the millennium, that won't be a problem. So it will be nice, just like in the Middle Ages, right? Scholars could all speak to each other in Latin, no matter what language they spoke, because every educated person knew Latin. So probably in the age to come, everyone will get free Hebrew lessons. That's just my opinion. But... We'll, we'll see. I won't, we'll, we'll already know it. It'll be, it'll be in our hard drive. So, but anyway, that's my take. And yes, perhaps my brother, are you, are, do you have a take on this? Or you have a separate question? Okay. I thought due to your, due to your background in learning, you might have a take on that. But. Thank you. Uh, you kind of, I think, got into a little bit. But like when you were saying that Jesus, or, or the plan had to be that the power is taken back through a man, right? Jesus couldn't just take it back and God couldn't create another man. I guess it's specific here, but <clears throat> more general in the Bible, like why do we have can'ts around what God can do? Besides, you know, he can't do things that are against his character and all that. But like if the devil could take the power or the ownership from man, why couldn't Jesus just be like, hey, that's mine, <laughs> and like take it back? And then why can't, I guess God cursed the earth, but why can't God just... I don't know. He's like, I destroyed the world with the rain, with the flood. I won't do it again. But like, he could do it another way if he wants to. So why couldn't he create a man? Besides the fact that it's like the most wise and you know benevolent way to have done it, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. No, it's a great question, and um, I always, I always appreciate these really simplistic, simple. <laughs> Can I repeat the question? No, nobody could repeat the question. <laughs> but uh, the, okay, well, well, the 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 question has to do with why 
why couldn't God just say, for example, okay, devil, you were bad. Uh, you, you took dominion. I'm taking it back, basically. Why can't God do that? But in David's formulation of it, he gave part of the answer. Part of the answer is, is God's character, right? So um, if God gives you a grant of authority, that is God's word to you, his commitment to you. So this is not like grounding a teenager, right, and taking back the car keys. This is, this is God actually making a grant of authority to you that you then can, can really, can ruin, right? And so God just can't come in as a naked exercise of power and take things back because that doesn't solve the problem in the heart of man now. Once that's been done, men and women are still sinners by nature because of their connection to Adam. And so there has to be a way that God can can deal with all of those dominion questions and still solve the sin problem because that doesn't affect, um, the dominion issue doesn't necessarily resolve the question of what goes on in your heart. So God could, in his justice and wrath, um, he could, you know, wipe out everyone. But, you know, once he has spoken that curse over something, like the earth in terms of its productivity and its vitality, how does God, on, on what basis does God take out his eraser and, and remove that? Because there, there's been no satisfaction made for any of, of the crimes that were committed and so forth and violations of God's character and God's word. So, so this is probably never the right way to speak about God, but it, it's, it, it's not easy for God just to draw an X through something and say, okay, that never happened. Because now, you know, um, when, when we're thinking about the holiness of God, that's what's driving everything. So God cannot compromise any of those points. And God would even, if I could say it this way, God would even be fair to the devil in the sense that God will not um, break another person's contract. So if, if I'm a minor, right, it's possible. It's possible now the laws may vary from one state to another. But you know what? Uh, minors can get themselves into a lot of trouble and their parents can pay for it. But you know what? The car is still wrecked. So we have a kind of similar situation here where it's like the devil, the devil might have been deceptive, but they went for it, and God is going to, let's say, not be unjust to the devil. So you only see God, and actually this, we'll, we will see this at the end of Revelation, God, God specifically gives this grant of authority to the devil and the Antichrist to let them do those certain things until the time is up. And it's only when those 42 months, we'll see later, are expired, that then God pours out his, his wrath and just really levels them, right? Because it's really only at that point that Satan has exceeded, let's say, in a legal sense, the parameters of what God has allowed him to do. At that point, really, he truly becomes a usurper. So God says, okay, you have X amount of time, and then, you know, what happens? They say in heaven, woe to you, because the devil has come down to you, and he, he has great wrath because he knows his time is short. Well, what is that time? Well, we know what that time is. We know that once we get to that certain point, God is like, okay, I'm coming down there now. <laughs> And that's, and that's the wrap-up of everything. So um, the short answer is that there is no short answer. It's, it's complicated, but it involves things that God has promised that he would do for man. Um, it involves the way that God devised his plan of salvation so that he would not um, destroy all life. 
and then, you know, move his activities to another planet and let the devil get defeated. And of course, you know, what's driving that is God's love. God so loved the world that he gave his son, that Jesus took on flesh so that whoever believes in him would not perish. So it's a, it's a great question. It really is. So I hope that's, I hope that's an attempt at answering it. So, okay. Um, so I'm putting myself kind of in like, trying to put myself in what John was thinking about. Okay. John was a disciple of Jesus. He, he was with him. And when the angel um, acts with a loud voice, who was worthy to open the scroll, wouldn't his first thought been like, you know, Jesus can't do it, no one can. But he was weeping as if like, I took it like, he took it like no one can open it. So that kind of confused me a little bit. Why was he weeping? Did he not know? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that, I think that the way that the scene is painted for us, um, I think there was, well, maybe maybe on stage or even in church, we might say that there was like a little too much dead air. <laughs> it's like, okay, is anybody going to step out here? <laughs> where where is the where is that one person? that should be stepping out, and where is everybody? So I don't know if it's just like a very pregnant pause, like did this last like 30 seconds and everybody's like just waiting with bated breath? So, so maybe it's some of that. I think some of it, of course, is, is John's own sense of being emotionally overloaded, right? Because John's, John's taken this down for us, things that no human being has ever seen. So his mind is already blown, and he still has hours of this to go, <laughs> right? So, so he's having one crazy day. Um, and, you know, part of it is, is the drama of him knowing what's at stake, right? You know, you guys have all been to the movies, and you watch movies, and you know that you don't really care about an action movie or something unless there's real stakes involved, right? So if you don't... If there's a snap of the finger and all life is going to be wiped out or <laughs> whatever it is, this, this, is the ultimate, this is the ultimate stakes right here. If you're writing this story, you're all pretending like you never saw a Marvel movie. I get it. It's okay. But this, but this is the ultimate in stakes because if, if no one comes forward to do this and take this scroll, it's over. It's over, right? The human race is finished. And so, you know, there's John's emotional upset. There's the drama of the scene. And there is a challenge, right? The, this other angel is like, who is worthy? And, and they're looking and like no one's coming forward. So maybe there's an investigation. We don't know how, how much time transpired. So it's, good. it's a good question. I have two questions. One, uh, first a comment. The, it could only be Christ. They could, because he was born without sin. No one else was born without sin. And plus he became a man, so it had to be a man. So that's the comment. The first question is, what is the purpose of the seven seals scroll? And I know it's a commission given to Christ, but what is the, it, was it written by the Father, I'm assuming? And the second question is, who determined the price that Jesus had to pay to release man from the devil? The easy questions continue tonight <laughs> in Harvest Time University. All right, um, come back next week and we'll talk about, we'll talk about opening the seals. <laughs> so we actually, all this is a prologue. So when we get into chapter six, that is when, uh, Christ begins to open the seals, but just the teaser is this. So um, those seals are a release of God's, um, really of God's restraint against, uh, against human evil. So there, that's the, basically the beginning of God's judgment against the world and God's overthrow of the kingdoms of man and the devil. So, so it starts out basically in, in a permissive way that God allows mankind to run amok with the wars and the famines and everything else. But then 
it transitions over when you get into the trumpets, which are like a warning, and then you get the bowls at the end, which is, which is a direct outpouring of God's wrath on the earth like we haven't seen since Noah's flood. So basically, as, as, each, as each seal is opened, there is this progressive, increasing, unfolding of, of the judgments of God the against the earth. Sorry? The wishes. Yes, this is what, this is what God is allowing. So we'll... We're, Christ is executing the will of God, and it's all with the, with, the, with the end in mind of destroying all opposition to the rule of God through Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus is coming, he's ruling for the Father. And so he's taking this, and every time he opens a seal, there is another step forward in that ultimate process, which is going to culminate in his personal return when all of these kingdoms of man and the devil are have been shattered so in, t- in terms of the of, of who wrote it uh, who put what was in it I guess this would have to be the plan that that was devised uh, uh, between the members of the Trinity that that they decided what this would look like and a lot of what's in there of course what is in revelation we have already seen in in the Hebrew prophets so we don't have a lot of details because um, Revelation is almost like a very brief spiritual commentary on, on a scenario that the Jewish people were already expecting because God had already given the scenarios, the various ways that this was going to roll forward in the Old Testament. So, um, so I, don't think, I don't think we know. I just think, I just think it's, um, yeah, someday we'll, someday we'll ask him exactly what it says but we do know that whenever he opens a seal, that there's more angelic activity that's releasing the uh, judgments of God into the earth. So as far as the price that was paid for redemption, that is something that that is something mysterious that, you know, that is in the councils of the Trinity. And, you know, that's where you get into the, the unknowable, at least for us in this age. You know how the Bible says that he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So before God even made a physical creation, this was already in his heart that, this, that it was going to happen this way and that it had already been determined among the persons of the Trinity that the son would be the one to become incarnate and to give his life to atone for sin. How the measure of that was was determined and how that works that's between the father and the son it's just a it's just a, a wonderful mystery i think i don't even think we can we will have to be in a body of the resurrection to begin to for for god to start talking to us about it in depth right paul says uh in ephesians he says that in, in the ages to come he might show us his loving kindness in Christ. So we're going to have to be in the resurrection with a resurrection body in heaven with a perfect mind for God to begin showing us the real depths of, of his grace to, and to see it a little bit from his perspective. That's, that's so mind-blowing to me. I mean, that's just unfathomable. So let me get over here. So. I was waiting for this side to wake up. I'm thinking how to deliver this question because uh, talking about David that, that says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who shall fulfill my will. When David sinned, he fulfilled the will of the Father because Jesus came to take out the sin of the world. Does he has a parallel to over there? Because it says that his will who shall fulfill my will. Yeah, I wouldn't extend it to the point of, of David's sin, no. Um, but, but the scripture does say that David died once he had fulfilled the purposes of God in his generation. So David... I believe that's indicating to us that David definitely fulfilled and accomplished the things that God gave him to do, right? In fact, there are a lot of things that David did 
to accomplish the will of God that, that we don't even know about because we only have little fragments of it. It's extremely interesting. I mean, if you study his life in detail, you know that David, uh, David and Samuel went like all around Israel, like appointing elders and so forth in all of the villages. David received visionary experiences from God where he got all the layout of the temple and everything. So there's a lot of amazing things that David did that we never talk about because they're just mentioned, I won't say in passing, but they, they don't get a large treatment. Then the, Most of the narrative uh, that we get in the Bible about David's life is, is all leadership lessons, but it doesn't tell you a lot of the other things that he did, whether it was in warfare or... Um, getting ready for the temple, and all of those kinds of things. So, so I would say that uh, if the scripture gives a testimony of you that you fulfilled the purposes of God in your generation, that's an awesome testimony. We know he was, we know he was not perfect, but I would have to say there's probably not many people about whom God could say, you know, he or she fulfilled the purposes of God in his generation. I mean, that's, that's a wonderful testimony, you know, it's a well done, good and faithful servant, especially for someone in leadership, because there's so much that comes at leaders and kings, right? So yeah, very, very good question. Some, somebody else? Yeah, but I, I know you're there. All right, I hope I'm going to ask this clearly. So it's kind of in relation to the question about why can't the Lord just, you know, the devil, make, you know, does what he does, and he just says, nope, you know, I want to take this back. So my question is, um, if the devil has the, I guess, not rain, but is kind of doing his thing here, and Jesus has authority but hasn't quite taken it here yet, um, how does that, or, or where does our authority in Christ come into play while we wait for his second coming? That's a good question, and I'm, and I'm glad somebody asked that. So at the moment, we're in this situation where in some ways uh, the kingdom of God has already come and broken into this world, but has not come in its fullness. So we're in this very strange in-between area. So where do we find the reign of God right now? We don't find God's reign outwardly manifested. We only find it in here. And so we're living in existence, right, that the Bible would say that we are, we are living as strangers and pilgrims in this world, that this world is not really our home, that we are citizens really of another kingdom right now. We are actually ambassadors of that kingdom here. And so Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, so then we're ambassadors and we, as though we were going and pleading to people on behalf of God saying, you know, we, we beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God, that that's our mission. And Jesus gives us the tools, the authority that we need in order to execute that mission. So God lives in us. We have the gifts of the Spirit. We also have the fruit of the Spirit, which demonstrates to the world that's watching us um, how good it is to belong to God and be in relationship with God, right? So we can see, taste and see that the, that the Lord is good. So, but yet, this is not our home. We are on enemy-controlled territory, so to speak. So, that's... That's why this is all so hard, <laughs> because we're not home yet, and we can't have an expectation that we, we settle in, that we get too cozy with this world. That's why John says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, because our hearts are supposed to be rooted in heaven, rooted in Christ. And we're acting in this world in his authority, which he has given us in order to extend his kingdom over people's lives and hearts, right? That's why, <clears throat> that's why we can do things in the name of Jesus. 
Jesus says, uh, so as you go out, heal the sick, cast out demons, and when you do, tell the people the kingdom of God has come near to you. What does that mean? That means that when those things happen, people then have seen a demonstration of the kingdom of God, and they must respond to it at that point. So so you have the authority in Christ to do that. You can cast demons out of someone, right? And in, in in that way, you're freeing that person from the dominion of Satan, same thing, when a person um, uh, surrenders his life to Christ and is saved, he's, he's born again by the Spirit of God. He is responding to God's word and God's invitation. And because of what Jesus did, Satan is, is powerless to do anything against that operation of God's word and, and declaration of God's word. So... Satan is, not, Satan is not able just because he, he is controlling, let's say, the government of the world. And John is very blunt about that. If you read 1 John, he says, we know that we are of God. <laughs> that's, that's confidence, amen. We are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. That's not very politically correct. But that was the apostles, Apostle John's viewpoint. We belong to God, and the whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. And that is true. But I'm an ambassador. You're an ambassador. We can go and exercise the authority that Christ has given us. Now, when he comes, you know, the apostle said, we are awaiting a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Righteousness does not dwell here right now. Righteousness only occasionally pops up right? In fact, righteousness is so much a stranger to our world that, you know, when it does show up, it's on the news. A young boy received a fine reward today when he returned a wallet. The happy owner gave the young tyke a hundred dollar bill and thanked him for his honesty. Like, that shouldn't be a news story. That should be like, you know, I fear God lest some evil come upon me if I return not said wallet unto its owner, right? And if you had the fear of God, you would say, well, of course I gave it back. It's not mine. But it's so shocking when righteousness does happen in this world that it ends up on the news, right? But when Christ returns, righteousness will be here, you know? I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know if somebody goes to mug you and an angel materializes out of nowhere and grabs them by the scruff of the neck and flies them off to to court. I don't know how it's going to work. But listen, it says that Jesus will rule the nations with a rod of iron. He will dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Go try that out in your, in your mom's house or your grandma's house. Take an iron bar, take a crowbar and smash a vase with it. And see how well the vase does under that treatment. That is what Jesus said. I'm going to do that to the nations because I am not going to allow war. I'm not going to allow crime. I am not going to allow injustice in that world. So, you know, but we ain't there yet. (laughs) So it's very hard to live in the in-between, but that's where we are. So way in the back. All right, I'm getting my steps in. We should have relays or, are you, were you a wide receiver in school? Can I? <laughs> yes, everyone sit up front, please. Okay, uh, what's the significance of wisdom being referred to as like feminine in Proverbs? And is there symbolism in the lamb being more like feminine and soft and the lion being more masculine and rough, and in Jesus embodying both? Hmm, interesting question. Well, I don't, I don't think uh, the lamb is feminine. I think that the softness and meekness and weakness of the image is, is just because that's what a lamb was for in the sacrificial system was, was to be sacrificed. And so it had to tamely submit to that treatment. Right? So that was what was prophesied of, of Jesus as, as the Lamb of God. It says that, you know, as a sheep before his shearers is, is dumb, is mute, 
in the same way he opened not his mouth. So he very meekly submitted to that and didn't protest at all of the, the torture, really. We need to use that word, all the torture that, that he was undergoing. So I don't think it's, it's a feminine image so much as it is an image of, of meekly or tamely submitting uh, to the treatment that he received. As far as, far as wisdom, I, I think it's just... Um, it's not, uh, it's not a personification in the sense that there is a f female entity somewhere called wisdom. I mean, that's not, that's not what that means. But um, because there are other times, I think, when, when the wisdom is portrayed as, as masculine. Um, so there is a picture there in the Proverbs where, it's, where I believe it's really Christ speaking prophetically, saying, you know, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways and I was daily beside him and so forth. So in other words, that Jesus was, was with the Father when he was doing all of this creative activity. Sometimes in the Proverbs, I think it's just a, a contrast maybe between uh, a moral woman and an immoral woman. Because what you have there in those early chapters of Proverbs, much of it is, is designed to keep men away from, from adultery and from prostitution. That's really... Uh, a lot of what it's what it's driving at. So, I, I don't think we can uh, we can take away from that that wisdom is a is a feminine entity. I mean, some people have gone into that in a kind of cultic way, and have kind of honored this personification of wisdom as if this as if there really is this spirit called wisdom that they should honor. But that is not really a Christian idea that's like a, a Gnostic idea that unfortunately some people have fallen into. And from there, people always start to get just a little weird, honoring angels, talking to angels and stuff. So, so I don't know. So I hope that's a little helpful. So, Frank. Uh, part C. This actually has to do with Ephesus. It's Ephesus. Actually, it goes back to Saturday. Now, Ephesus um, received this letter from John eventually, the church. But how does that fall in the time frame as when Paul was there? Because Paul preached there. I don't know whether that was before or after this letter would have come from John. And then they drove him out, uh, Paul, the, you know, the merchants in the town and and of course, today, Ephesus is a ruins, and it is far from the sea. It is far from being a seaport, so it has no, there's nothing left, really. It's ruins. Well, that was, that was in a generation prior. So when, when Paul's in his journeys, you know, when he's in Ephesus, that's in the 50s. Oh, okay. And this is, you know, the mid-90s, right, that John is, is writing you know, around 95, 96 A.D. So, but it wasn't the church that drove out Paul. No, it was the town. Right. But by the same token, um, there ended up being a tremendous revival there. Uh, so when you go um, in Acts 19, in Acts chapter 20, that's where there was that great move of the Lord against the witchcraft. That's where they had that bonfire and they just brought all of their occult books and so forth to be burned. And it was a tremendous amount of money. I think, I think, I think it says, if anybody has their Bible it can check, I think it was like 50,000 silver pieces worth of occult literature that was burned. I mean, that's like a phenomenal amount of money. So, because the whole city was devoted to it. But, but Paul, um, the Bible says, had an open door there. And he was able to minister there for, for quite some time. So when he says goodbye to them in the next chapter, in Acts chapter 20, he says that he was able to, to give them the, the whole counsel of God. So basically, he had enough time with them in Ephesus that he was able to teach them basically everything important that God would want a person to know from the Bible. Paul was able to, to train them in those things. And, and so Ephesus really, um, Ephesus became, as I, I think I mentioned in the seminar, on the seven churches became like the first mega church really in world history. It was a huge church. It's like the second biggest city in the world or the Roman world. And it was a huge church, probably many thousands of, of Christians were there. So, but you know, um, but they did react to the letter of John. 
Well, we don't know how they reacted to it. We don't know how they reacted to John's letter. I mean, we know, we know what the Lord said. We know that, that they had gotten a little bit into, it had become maybe a little bit of a machine and the heart of worship and so forth wasn't there anymore and they were just going through the motions and being dutiful but not with their not with their first love. So we just, we just don't know. We just don't know how any of these places responded to that. But but I but you're right in that. I think none, none of these cities survive in any meaningful way except for Smyrna. Um, so yeah, interesting. Anybody else, Miss Sasha? Okay, I probably asked you something like this before in another class, but I know God knows everything before it happens, <clears throat> that goes as, as far as, you know, Adam and Eve, right? So though Jesus was the first birthed non-sinful man, technically Adam and Eve were the first created non-sinful humans. When God knew what he was gonna do with Noah, right? Because of Adam and Eve, why didn't he just, like, I'm going to make a joke, but why, why didn't he just remove Adam and Eve and create Karen and Steve and start all over again? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, why, why did it have to go to that such extreme? Why did he even wait for Noah? You know, I it, it just feel like he could have started over. There's plenty of dirt. He could have re-breathed into the, you know, why, why would he have waited for all of this to, why didn't he try again? <laughs> well, he did try again successfully, which, which was his point, I suppose. The, this, the second attempt is Christ. That's why the Bible says it refers to him as the second Adam. So we have two human families that we can belong to. We are all born into that sinful human family but we can all hopefully respond to the call of God to come over and also be a part of that other human family, which is to be in Christ. And so just as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. That's what the Bible says. So the second attempt was not wiping out Adam and Eve and making Carrie and Steve. The second plan was... Um, second attempt, if you want to use that language, it wasn't an attempt because it was planned, but um, was for God himself to step in. That very first prophecy of scripture was, was God saying that he was going to send someone that to, to be that someone of the seed of the woman would be the, would be the one to crush the serpent's head. So that right there, by the way, to others who asked similar questions, that right there means that God had spoken, again, that someone who was also human would be the one to do it. So God also confined himself, limited himself to resolving it that way through another human being. So I don't think I've completely answered your question, but... but that, that was God's solution, not to make another set of people, because if you, have, if you have another set of people, you still have the same problem that God cursed the ground for Adam and Eve's sake. And there was, there was nothing to suggest that, let's just talk hypothetically, if God makes another set of people, what's to stop that other second set of people from messing up? I mean, ultimately, we're, we're probably going to fail at some point. And so, <clears throat> the, yeah, but the, but the reason, the reason why this covenant does not fail, cannot fail, is because this covenant does not depend upon my obedience. This covenant depends upon the perfect obedience of Christ, which is not going to fail. So, and certainly anything derived from Adam is doomed to failure and doomed to die, but, but not not what's rooted in Christ. So, did, did you have a hand up? So, not so much a question, but um, I, hear, I hear a lot of people questioning, um, I say it in plain terms, God's timing. 
Like, why didn't he do it earlier? Why didn't he do it this way or that way? And, and what I feel right now is that, you know, the perfection of God. I don't think that God was doing a trial and error. Like, God knew exactly how everything was going to play. And this, everything that has happened had to happen to get us to that point of perfection. I truly believe that. And I think that a lot of people are feeling like, you know, the world's going to get to its worst until, you know, he returns. But sometimes I feel like um, every person that's born now or in the future before God comes is necessary in the perfection of his plan and that we just need to trust in his perfection and his timing. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good thought. Listen, um, you know, I believe that, that everything, every work of God is, is perfect. Everything that God does is perfect. And and in Christ, even those things in our lives that seem to be setbacks and problems and messes, right? God still uses those things. He's the only God that can redeem. He's the only God that brings good out of things that are evil, you know? Joseph said it. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Uh, those two things can be true at the same time. A person could intend harm against you, and yet God can still bring good out of it, right? The Bible says, we know, I like that part, we know that, that all things, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are the called ones according to his purpose. And that's maybe the most magnificent word of encouragement uh, in, in all of scripture. So we have to, we have to rest on that. We have to trust God's plan that God knows what he's doing, right? We, we live in a, a, a culture, a society of comfort. So anything that pokes my comfort in the slightest bit, I'm freaking out and complaining to God, you know? So yeah, that's a good, that's a good thought. Okay. Just one or two more because I am you know, what did David say? My heart and my flesh, they may fail, but God is the strength of my life. How are you, brother? Pretty good. Um, I had a question about the, uh, the strategy of Balaam and this expansion of... Um, so in relation to what we just discussed, like, do you see how the, the devil... Like, does, does the devil... Well, it seems like it's, it's everywhere, so he expands his authority... So he took something from the garden and it was just a disobedience to God and he expanded that to take possession of the whole of the earth. And so, like, do you see this, like, strategy of Balaam and, like, Solomon? It was like the, he fell away because they sent... Yeah. yeah, that's good insight. So, you know, we talked about it... Um, I can't remember what day we talked about it. Was it in the... Uh, it was in the Saturday seminar, right? Because we were talking about those couple of churches that were compromising. So... So yeah, the way that the way that Balaam was helped the Moabites defeat Israel was by inducing Israel to sin, and then they lost the protection, the blessing of God. Um, but here's the, here's the interesting thing when it when it comes to when it comes to Israel, when it comes to God's people, God has made some unconditional promises to them, and so sure, the enemy can mess them up, he can cause them to disobey, and then they lose their covenant blessings, and then ultimately they get expelled out of the land. In fact, that was, that was what was promised, kind of a negative promise, right? But, but then God has another set of promises that he has made to them that are unconditional. So just because of his love for them, he is going to make sure that they will ultimately those who survive, be, be saved and forever remain in the way of righteousness. And he will cause that to happen. He will turn their hearts so that they will always and forever serve him and never go back to those ways, which is amazing. And that is what the scripture is indicating that that is what the scripture is indicating is going to happen at the end of the age. So the, the Lord will appear and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. That's what it says. So when Christ appears, and then all throughout the kingdom, all throughout the millennial kingdom, they will be preserved as a nation that obeys God 
and then they will not ever be expelled from, from the land again. So it's, it's powerful. It's, an, it's a marvelous promise. People say it's not fair. Why should he do that for them? It's like, well, it's not fair that he saved you and me either. Uh, talking about why God allow, allow all the people to be born or be assistants when, when he created Adam and Eve, what comes to my mind is that we were predestined before the world began. And for if, if we were predestined, everything had to happen in certain place and a certain time. And also, um, I went blank. <laughs> And also, but, but also, we had to take in a, a consideration that Christ was um, crucified before the foundation of the world. And if Christ having come, if, if Christ having come, how then can that be fulfilled? So it has to happen like that. Yeah, God has, God has a timing for all these things. So in Galatians, Paul said that in the fullness of time, God sent Christ to, to be born under the law, born of a woman. So, so yeah, there is a timing to all those things, and God has appointed the times that the nations should exist in their various configurations. He appointed the time that you would be alive. Why are you alive now instead of in the 1400s? It's because God chose that you should be born in, in this time, and so we just... Our obligation is to just flow with that, to just submit our lives to God and say, God, here I am. Uh, fulfill all your will in me and let me fulfill the purposes of God in my generation. So, <laughs> amen. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Next week, we're going to open, or no, we're going to watch Jesus open the scrolls. <laughs> we're not opening them. So, God bless you guys.